Hello, we welcome you to the Bible study today. This series will be on the book of Ecclesiastes. If you will, please turn in your Old Testament of your Bible to the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll begin. Before we get into the first chapter, let's begin with an introduction to the book. First, who is the author? The book of Ecclesiastes is attributed according to verse 1 of chapter 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. He writes, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Ecclesiastes 1 and 12. The king who reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was Solomon. 1 Kings, 1, 1 Kings 11, 42 and 43. And the period that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. We also see the same information recorded in 2 Chronicles 9, 30 to 31. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over Israel 40 years. King Solomon was known by everyone for his wisdom and proverbs. Passages like 1 Kings 4, 29 to 34, describe how that he was world renowned for his wisdom. People coming to see the wisdom of Solomon. Ecclesiastes 12 and 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, say, yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs, Ecclesiastes 12 and 9. The same king over Israel who wrote the book of Proverbs also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Proverbs 1 and verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So who's the author of the book of Ecclesiastes from Ecclesiastes 1 and 1 and also verse 12? we see that the best person who fits is that of Solomon, the king of Israel. Second, we see the date. King Solomon, the son of David, reigned in Jerusalem over Israel for 40 years until he died and joined his ancestors. He also wrote Ecclesiastes when he was king in Jerusalem, according to Ecclesiastes 1 and 1. From the context of the book, it appears that he wrote Ecclesiastes near the end of his life. Passages like 1 Kings 11 and 4. Solomon lived in the 10th century BC. And there are authors who place his writing at around 900 BC. The title of the book is Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew term, which means preacher. The term occurs seven times, all in the book of Ecclesiastes. The preacher, or teacher as one version reads, is one who calls together and instructs the assembly. The term ecclesiastical, for instance, is defined as of or relating to a church, especially of an established institution. And so the idea of ecclesiastical or relating to a church, the literal translation of the Greek term ecclesia in the New Testament is assembly, according to Young's literal translation. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church or my assembly. And so the title of the book, Ecclesiastes, or The Preacher. And so the preacher is described here, and this teacher we believe to be Solomon. A key term that you'll find as you study the book of Ecclesiastes is the term vanity. It occurs 33 times in the New King James Version. The word, the Greek term, or the Hebrew term, refers literally to a breath like we see in Psalm 144 in verse 4, or a vapor, like we see in Psalm 39 in verse 5. Psalm 144 and 4, man is like 
a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. And so there we see the temporary nature of man, brevity of life, his being described as a breath or as in Ecclesiastes, vanity. Psalm 39 and 5, Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man in his best state is but vapor. And so that word vapor is the same term translated literally as breath or as vapor in this passage, also figuratively as vanity in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so in most instances, including all of those instances in the book of Ecclesiastes, the noun metaphorically means vanity or futility or something which is temporary. And so you see renderings like futility in Psalm 78, 33, and futile in Psalm 94 and verse 11, and fleeting in Proverbs 21 and verse 6. Futility, futile, fleeting. And so the idea of vanity. What is the purpose of the book? Ecclesiastes exposes the vanity of labor, quote, under the sun. This phrase occurs 29 times and describes the vanity of labor in this world, under the sun, in this world. Similar phrases include on earth, under heaven, and likewise. This describes the pursuits of man in this world. And so the worldly are devoted to the world and its pursuits. Solomon began the book with a question in chapter 1, verse 3. What profit has a man from all his labor which he toils under the sun? As he searched for truth, he found that, according to verse 8, the eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear with hearing. And so he tested wisdom and pleasure, and he found that there is no profit under the sun. Chapter 2, verse 11. After continuing to test the matter in his heart, what did Solomon have to say? Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. A couple of thoughts to consider from the New Testament. Ecclesiastes exposes the vanity of life lived in worldliness. And so Solomon teaches us how life is vanity without God. Denote your, devote your life to higher pursuits. We all need food and clothing. And so the lesson that we learn in the New Testament is to work for what we need and not to overwork. Jesus taught in Matthew 6 and 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 16, 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He also said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Luke 12 and 30 and 23. Also consider reading the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, 13 to 23. The apostle Paul teaches in Colossians 3 and 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And so the man who would think that life is food, that life is clothing, that life is shelter, or you fill in any number of things, pleasure, possessions, wealth, if that's all the world is to you, that's all life is. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. In Hebrews 11, we see this faith chapter of the Bible, this hall of heroes. And in Hebrews 11 and 6, he says, but without faith it is possible, impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. 
And so the idea of seeking God diligently in this life through faith and that God will reward the faithful. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in, in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And so Moses acted by faith, and rather than enjoying the passing pleasures of sin, he looked to, to something greater, something far greater, the reward given to those who diligently seek God. Hebrews 11 and 16, he says, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so the worldly man, according to definition, is one devoted to this world and its pursuits. According to Solomon, if your pursuits are in this world, under the sun, if those are your only pursuits, vanity of vanity, always vanity, says the preacher. Well, that gives us an introduction to the book. Well, let's look now at chapter one of Ecclesiastes. In verses one to 11, we see the vanity of life. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. This section, verses 1 to 11, serves as an introduction to the book. How Solomon taught the vanity of life in this world through the eyes of the worldly man. And during his life, Solomon searched for satisfaction, could find no meaning in the works of man. Verse 1, the author here identifies himself as the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And in verse 12, he later wrote, he was king over Israel. And so it was Solomon, the son of David, who ruled over Israel in Jerusalem. Most versions read preacher here in verse 1. Another version reads teacher. And as I mentioned earlier, this term is found seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Verse 2, vanity of vanities says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The term vanity literally refers to a vapor or breath, as we noted earlier. It metaphorically describes something which is fleeting or passing or futile, something temporary. We looked at some examples earlier from the Psalms. Life in this world, apart from God, is vanity. You'll note various instances in the book where Solomon speaks of fearing God. One version here for vanity reads meaningless. Instead of living life under the sun in vanity and meaninglessness, seek to live under God who made the sun, who made creation. The person who does that certainly will find meaning in his life, according to Solomon. The book of Ecclesiastes begins with these words and ends with these words in Ecclesiastes 12 and 8 and here in 1 and verse 2. It's as though they're given as Solomon's signature at the end of the book. At first, there is the search for meaning in the labor of man, and no meaning is found, but by the end of the book, there is no meaning found in the labor of man apart from the fear of God. What profit has a man? Solomon wrote, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? As he searched for profit, satisfaction, in worldly wisdom and pleasure. Solomon wrote, there is no prophet under the sun, chapter two and verse 11. After his search is complete, his conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all, chapter 12, verse 13. 
The qualifying phrase in this verse, verse three, is under the sun. Again, it occurs 29 times in the book. Some versions read profit, advantage, or gain. What profit, advantage, or gain has a man from all his labor under the sun? What advantage, gain, or profit does the man obtain if he labors only for the things in this world? He will have nothing. Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verses 4 to 8, we see the life of man is passing. Solomon wrote, one generation passes away, and another generation comes, but earth abides forever. Solomon attempts to answer the question of verse 3, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? And he spends the bulk of the book discussing this issue in some way or another until he finally reaches the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. In verses four to eight, he describes the life of man and how it is passing. Verse four, he says, one generation passes away. So a generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth abides, remains forever. And so while the earth remains, a generation of people passes away. Well, another generation of people comes. Generations have come and gone over and over again. Solomon compares the human generation with the earth. And to the human observer, the earth remains forever. This appears to be the case given that a generation goes and a generation comes all while the earth remains relatively the same. While man's life is but a vapor or a breath, the earth continues throughout the generations of people. A side note for this passage. Solomon is not saying that the earth will literally abide forever, that it will never end. We see from other Bible passages that there will come a time when the earth will end. Second Peter 3, 8 to 13, Peter writes about how the earth will be burned or dissolved with the coming of the Lord. However, while generations of men come and go, the earth will remain until it serves its purpose, the purpose of its creator, the creator of man. And so the point here that Solomon is, is making is all about how the one generation passes away, another generation comes. Again, speaking of the vanity, uh, the passing nature of man. Verse 5 the sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. So as one generation passes away and another generation comes, the sun also rises and the sun goes down. People today speak of sunrise and sunset. And from our perspective, the sun rises and the sun goes down. Watch the news and the news forecaster, the weatherman, will talk about sunrise and sunset. And we understand uh, what he's talking about. While it's dark, the sun, according to, this, according to Solomon, the sun appears to hasten to the place from which it arose. And the journey of the sun continues day after day. And so we see how it goes on and on. Verse 6, the wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. And so the wind goes to the south, the wind goes to the north, the wind whirls about continually, and it does this again and again. Verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. And so the rivers of the earth run into the sea, yet despite continually flowing into the sea, the sea is not full. The water that once flowed to the sea returns again from the place from which it came, only to run to the sea again. For all the flowing of the river, all the rivers of the earth flowing into the sea, 
the sea is not full. Verse 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. And so all things are full of labor. Other versions read weariness. It might make you tired just thinking about the, the various expressions of how things come and go and, and move and, and return and, and the various figures of the water, the sea, the rivers, and the, and the wind and the sun and, and man himself. And so he says, all things are full of labor. Man, man cannot express it. Full of weariness. And so it's difficult for man to adequately express how full of labor all things are in this world under the sun. He looks at the labor of men. He also looks at the labor of the sun and the wind and the rivers. For example, despite all the rivers which run into the sea, the sea is not full. We see in verse 7. And so we asked, Solomon asked, where is the prophet? For example, where's the prophet of the rivers? And so the point that he's making from nature and addressing his teaching to man is that there is no prophet. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. As much as one might see or as much as one might hear, there is always more to see and there's always more to hear. It's not as though the eye gets tired of seeing or that the ear gets tired of hearing. Proverbs 27 and 20, Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. And so when we think about vanity, we think of what is the work of man? And if it's done under the sun, solely in this world, with no thought world to come, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And so the idea here in verse 9 that which has been is that which will be, and that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. And so verse 9, the main point is there's nothing new in this world. Solomon returns the matter to his question, what profit has a man from all his labors in which he labors, toils under the sun? Generation comes, generation goes, things of the past will be done in the future, what is done in the present will also be done in the future. And so there's nothing truly new under the sun. Some people take pleasure and delight in things that are new. Really, it's all been done before. There's nothing truly new. Verse 10, is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. And so the point here is, well, there's nothing new, but now he's saying it has already been done. And so in the realm of men, there is nothing which is truly new for mankind as a whole. The feelings experienced by modern men are those experienced in some fashion by ancient men as well. Verse 11, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after and now the main point is there is no remembrance. And so those three points, there's nothing new. It has already been done and there's no remembrance. Verse 11, no remembrance of former or earlier things. For example, the present generation does not remember the things of earlier generations. Likewise, future generations will have no remembrance of the present generation. The only way that one, that there may be some remembrance of former things today is if earlier generations decide to keep records which are passed on to each succeeding generation. Think about the amount of information that is lost to time, which passes, which is not recorded. And so in verses one to 11, Solomon writes about the vanity of life. He's setting out this book, thinking about the profit of the works of men in this world under the sun. Verses 12 to 18, he describes the vanity of wisdom and knowledge. He says in verse 12, I, the preacher, was king 
over Israel in Jerusalem. Again, look back to verse 1, where, he's, where he describes how that he wrote the book. The preacher said that he was king, here in verse 12. Uh, this does not mean that he was no longer king at the time that he wrote the book. Some versions read here, have been. And so I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And so for the context, it appears that, it, it does appear that he wrote the book near the end of his life and reign. And so the earlier passages that we noted from Kings and Chronicles describe how that he was king for 40 years and then he died. And so it appears that he died during his reign and then he was succeeded by his son. Verse 13, he said, and I set my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task which God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. You'll notice in the following passages, the use of the term, the personal pronouns, I, and say, I did this, or I did that focusing on Solomon and the things that he tried and experienced in life and what he had learned from it. Verse 13, Solomon was determined to answer the question, what profit does a man have? What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Verse 3. And so he searched out using his wisdom, all that is done under heaven or under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1, 3, 9, and 14. He also described it as a burdensome task, which God has given the man that they may be exercised. Some versions read that they may be afflicted with or busy with. And so this is a, a monumental task for him to undertake. But who better than the wise king Solomon? Solomon the preacher was a believer of God. And he took up the task of finding the prophet of all that is done under the, under the sun, under heaven. He found, though, that the pursuit was a burdensome task, monumental undertaking. Uh, it, was, it was a grievous task, or it was an unhappy business. It was a heavy burden. Just think about what he was trying to, to figure out. And imagine the, the sorrow that that might bring the great work and burden that he must have felt. The phrase under heaven or done under heaven appears to be the same as the more common phrase done under the sun. And so again, the meaning is basically in this world, in the world, under the sun. First John five and three, I wanna point out a New Testament passage. Now, sometimes people who are who, who are following the will of God may find it to be a burden, but those who love God will keep his commandments and will not find it burdensome. That is the idea of actually keeping his word. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and all his commandments are not burdensome. Now the task that Solomon had undertaken was burdensome to him, trying to figure out the answer to the question in verse three. Verse 14, he says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. And so Solomon set out for himself this burdensome task of knowing all that is done under heaven. He said that he had seen all the works done under the sun. What did he learn from undertaking such a job? Well, he learned that indeed all is vanity. Ecclesiastes 1, 2, 14, chapter 2, 17, 3, 19, and 12, 8. He described that all works that are done under the sun are like grasping for the wind. What might that mean? Well, try grasping for the wind. Can it be done? Vanity of vanities. Futility can't be done. Verse 14 some versions describe it as striving after the wind or chasing after the wind. Can be done. Verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. This is an expression of futility. There is the impossibility of man making something straight which is crooked by nature. 
It's impossible to number everything that is lacking. This is the way it is in the world. There are so many things in this world that man is powerless to change. How many things are there that cannot be put into order? How many inadequacies are there which cannot be numbered or counted? Verse 16, he said, I have communed with my heart, saying, look, I have obtained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart understood, has understood great wisdom and knowledge. And so he set his heart to seek and to search out all that is done under heaven. He communes with his heart. And so he intimately talks and, and thinks these matters through calling for his heart to consider how he obtained greatness, he gained wisdom, he understood knowledge, he did all those things. I, I have to point out that according to 1 Kings 3, 10 to 14, wisdom obtained his, his wisdom from God. 1 Kings 3, 10 to 14, it reads, the speech, this speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemy, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall there be any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that these sh there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life, your days. And so Solomon received his wisdom in answer to, to prayer to God, and God blessed him with all that he had. Someone might ask, where is Solomon's humility now? This is similar to the rich fool who had thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? Luke 12 and 17. At the time Solomon is describing, he was concerned with life under the sun and really did not consider his soul in that way. We have to remember that Solomon wrote this book and he's describing things that have happened during his life. These things that don't all happen at once. And so he's describing a progression. There are things that have changed through his life, uh, some for good, some for bad. And he's describing some of those things here of the things that he experienced during his life. Verse 17, he says, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. He, al he already said how he had seen all the works that are done under the sun and that all is vanity and grasping for the wind, wind, verse 14, and included in all the works is to find profit or satisfaction in his wisdom. He set his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. Now he says how he set his heart to know wisdom or to know the understanding of wisdom. He also said to know madness and folly. Well, to know these things would help him to exercise wisdom in avoiding such foolishness. Ultimately, this pursuit to know wisdom or find satisfaction in the understanding of wisdom was also vanity or grasping for the wind. It was futile. Verse 18, for in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. As Solomon set out by wisdom to find the profit in the works of man, the first work he tested was wisdom. 
Was there profit in wisdom? He learned that in much wisdom, there is much grief. Likewise, he also learned that in increasing in knowledge, increases sorrow. When we think about wisdom, we think about the wisdom that Solomon taught in the book of Proverbs, the kind of wisdom that men ought to have, the kind of wisdom that begins with the fear of God and that men would conduct themselves accordingly, wisely. If we're talking about worldly wisdom, certainly such wisdom is vanity. But in the wisdom that comes from above, we see that there is indeed purpose and meaning in the fear of God in such wisdom that begins with the fearing God and keeping his commandments. And we'll continue our study next time. This ends our study of our introduction and the first chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. This book requires a lot of contemplation and study, and we're glad that you're here with us today to study along as we study verse by verse through the book. Lord willing, we'll see you again next time. We hope that you'll come and continue on as we study chapter two. Thank you for your time.